Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and welcome everyone. My name is Sally Zweimuller, um, and we're going. We're delighted to have you today for today's session. So let's get started. Uh, you will see the screen shift as we uh, move into the um, presentations that we'll be doing today. Um, uh, as I mentioned, my name is Sally Zweimuller. I'm a dissemination specialist with the Democrat. I, I, I can tell we have a lot of people joining right now. This is fantastic. So if um, throughout the um, event, if you could please uh, mute your line, that way we can um, 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 hear the present presenters. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so today I will be your host for today's virtual dissemination webinar of the 2019 Ghana Malaria Indicator Survey. I'd like to start with some expectation setting and a comment about our current situation. The COVID-19 pandemic has quickly changed our world. Our professional and personal lives have been greatly impacted. Amid the stress and uncertainty, we hope that you, your families and colleagues are staying safe and healthy. The COVID-19 pandemic has required us to make some changes. Originally, we planned to disseminate the 2019 Ghana Malaria Indicator Survey, or GMIS, at an event in Accra with the malaria community and media. Today, we all join from different locations around the world in front of our laptops or mobile phones. I'm joining today from Rockville, Maryland. We, the Ghana Statistical Service, the Ghana National Malaria Control Program, the United States Agency for International Development and the DHS program want to show our appreciation to everyone joining us from home or work today. Thank you for your focus and commitment. We too have been working from home, so please have patience with any audio glitches. Throughout today's webinar, please mute your line and use the chat function to ask questions at any time throughout the webinar. The agenda of our two hours together is shown on the screen. Uh, we will hear remarks from the Ghana Statistical Service, the National Malaria Control Program, and the U.S. Embassy, and we will have a chairperson guide us through um, um, uh, some questions that we have after a key findings presentation by the Ghana Statistical Service and National Malaria Control Program. Um, after the Q&A discussion, um, we'll follow a demonstration of how to visualize Ghana MIS data in Stack Compiler, a web tool. Now on to the program. First, I would like to introduce our chairperson, Professor Kwejo Anza Koram. Uh, I hand it over to you. Yep, thank you very much, Sally. And uh, good afternoon and welcome to everybody. And good morning to our US colleagues. I think it's in the morning at your end. Uh, it's quite interesting. This is the first time I'm being asked to chair a meeting that I see people, but I don't see them. <laughs> so um, we will go through the agenda as uh, well, the GMIS has been presented. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing what the control program has been able to do over the years. Uh, personally, for me, it's been very interesting and exciting that finally we get to get um, empirical data supporting all the good work that they've been doing over the years and for us also to learn where to come in and where to make more effort as we gear towards elimination and eradication possibly as the time goes on. Um, I know that I came on this at a bit late, uh, but personally, from a personal point of view, there was no way I could say no when I was asked to do this because I've been with the program all through my research life, uh, working in some programs with them, some of the programs that we've done to collect data for them. So I'm happy that I'm here and welcome to everybody. Uh, this report self those of us in academia, especially in very diverse ways, and I'm looking forward to hearing what was, been, what was found uh, last year, the second one that uh, we have been thinking. So I would end the brief remarks and listen to the presenters, and then at the end, we'll come back and see what we can do. Thank you very much. 
Um, thank you, Professor Karam. I apologize, I forgot to read um, your profile and introduce you properly. So I, I will do a quick summary. Um, Professor Karam is the immediate past director of the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research and is currently a professor of epidemiology in the Department of Epidemiology at the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research. He's an alumnus of the Ghana Medical School, Tulane University, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Before joining faculty at Noguchi, Professor Karam worked as the district medical officer at Baku and then as the scientific officer epidemiology at the Medical Research Council in Fajara, the Gambia. Um, I, I welcome you and your wealth of expertise and knowledge um, to, to this um, uh, webinar today. So thank you very much. I apologize for that. Um, next, um, after our chairperson, I would like to introduce um, uh, Dr. Samuel Kobina uh, Anim, Government Statistician of the Ghana Statistical Service. Dr. Anim is a professor of economics with a special interest in microfinance, poverty, health, and household issues, analytical techniques, and micro-level data management and analysis with a geographical focus in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. As a government statistician, um, um, he drives the policy and programs of the Ghana Statistical Service. He has a PhD in economics from the University of Manchester School of Social Science, UK Certificate of Completion. Um, and he is has been a director of research, innovation, and cons Consultancy, University of Cape Coast Head, Department of Economics at the University of Cape Coast, Ghana. And he has been teaching several courses at the undergraduate and graduate uh, level. He is a member of African um, Economic Research Consortium, uh, International AIDS Economic Network, and International Union for the Scientific Study and Population, and has served on a number of committees. Um, he's had a number of awards, including the 2018 recognition of doctoral supervisory role for one of his one of the best doctoral theses. So, um, the government statistician, I hand it over to you and welcome. Thank you, Sally. Good morning, colleagues in the U.S. and good afternoon, colleagues in Ghana. It's a pleasure for me to give a quick remark ahead of the interesting findings that. We all are looking forward to in connection with the Ghana Malaria Indicator um, Survey. I must indicate that this is pretty special for me for two reasons. First, as Sally, you mentioned, around this awkward time that we find ourselves in as a global community, there is always the temptation for us to forget about some of, health, some of the health challenges that we've been grappling with for more than a decade, and one of which is uh, malaria. And also the fact that this is one of the studies by GSS that within a year we're going to share the results so that timely policies that are going to come out of the findings from these results would be things that are currently with us. They are not five years old, they are not three years old. So I need to commend the team for the joint effort that they've put in to ensure that amid COVID-19, we've been able to put together the results from data that we collected just last year. Let me go ahead and say a big appreciation to the donors who have supported the process throughout, specifically USAID Ghana, through the US President's Malaria Initiative, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, and of course, the government of Ghana's support. Indeed, the intrinsic value in the support that we receive is the improved health status that persons in Ghana continue to enjoy and particularly since 1988, when we rolled out our first demographic and health survey in Ghana. The National Public Health and Reference Laboratory of the Ghana Health Service worked in collaboration with GSS and the National Malaria Control Program in the survey implementation. Indeed, we are very thankful to ICF for the technical support that they provided. The Ghana MIS is one of the key performance monitoring tools that are used to provide in that assessment of malaria over time. So it's not just giving us a sense of, a snapshot sense of what is happening, but it provides us an opportunity to interrogate the data, to sort of pull out all the drivers, both the latent and the observed um, variables. As was indicated, this is the second malaria indicator survey of which the first one was conducted in 2016. 
to ensure that our programs are working and that the resources are located in the best way possible, it is important for such surveys to always be, be um, undertaken. It gives us an opportunity to monitor and evaluate the interventions that we have we've put in place. And it's my ex expectation that after today's presentation, we would get a good sense of whether this program worked or the other did not, and whether we need to tweak it in a way that would achieve the best results that is expected. Data collection specifically spanned from 25th September to 24th November 2019, where we took 12 teams throughout the country to collect data for us. Indeed, my biggest appreciation goes to the field data collection personnel that collected data under very harsh um, conditions. And I'm happy that throughout this, they maintained a certain level of tenacity to ensure that we have good data that one, one expects. We also are very grateful to our respondents that is a more than 5,000 women who dedicated themselves to the process of finding solutions to help us prevent and cure malaria. GSS is particularly thankful to the director of the National Public Health Reference Laboratory, Dr. David Opari and his team, Professor Collins Aholu of Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, University of Ghana, and his team for the quality assurance tax on microscopy testing that they carried out for us. The program manager of NMCP, Dr. Kezia Mam, we, we are very thankful for your wonderful collaboration that we've had with you since, and we are hoping that the media will top, will top all these interventions to help us communicate this in the right way. We are very grateful, and I look forward to a very instructive engagement. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anim. Um, for those thoughtful welcome remarks, I'm happy to hear that this is a special event for you amid COVID-19 and that we're still able to look at recent malaria data in Ghana. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Kezia El Mal, uh, Program Manager of the National Malaria Control Program. Uh, Dr. Mal is the Program Manager of the National Malaria Control Program, the Ghana Health Service, and is a public health physician specialized in epidemiology with a distinguished career in malaria. As the program manager, Dr. Mall um, leads the strategic direction and planning for all malaria control interventions in Ghana. She was the first female fellow by examination of the Ghana College of Physicians College, Faculty of Public Health. Um, the program manager occupies vital roles in academia and research from her engagements in public health. At the School of Public Health, University of Ghana, she served as academic coordinator for the workshop on monitoring and evaluation for malaria planning since its inception in 2010 till 2016 and currently facilitates the coursework. She also lectures part-time at the School of Public Health and Malaria Planning, Field Epidemiology, Outbreak Investigation and Surveillance. Surveillance. Um, Dr. Mall, I hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Sally. Good afternoon to all the members here present. Indeed, we are very grateful that we have a high patronage. Today, I am very honored that we are having this and I'm here representing the Ghana National Malaria Control Program in the launch of the 2019 Ghana Malaria Indicator Survey. I want to add my voice to that of members who are um, colleagues who've already spoken to say welcome to all the distinguished members. And also say a big thank you to the government of Ghana, to our development partners, US, USAID, um, through the President's Malaria Initiative, the Global Fund, and also our partners in country whose support has brought us this fight, allowed us to improve the health of Ghanaians when we talk about malaria. We all know that malaria poses a major health problem in Ghana. Um, the government of Ghana is seriously committed to controlling malaria with the multiple strategies that we have. We, we are talking about vector control interventions, including provision of insecticide treated nets, indoor residual spraying, larval source management, intermittent preventive treatment um, for pregnant women. And also we ensure that if in the unfortunate event of somebody getting malaria, the person is appropriately um, tested and treated. All these activities are supported 
protected by the uh, research, surveillance, and monitoring. That's why Prof. Kuram kept saying that he's been working with us for a long time because research is one of the pillars that underpins our work. So today's um, activity is very important to us because it says as providing the data for our monitoring and evaluation um, of the interventions that we undertake. All these are also supported by advocacy, communication, as well as mobilizing the needed resources for us to undertake our interventions. That's why, just like um, Dr. Samuel said, um, Dr. Enin said, it's important that our media partners take this information from here and communicate to the general public for us. I know the main objective of the MIS this year is to provide up-to-date estimates of the malaria indicators in Ghana including prevalence of anemia and malaria in children. I'm not going to go too much about how the survey was done because I'm sure the, the presenters that will follow will tell us how it was done. But the exciting news before the main story is told is that we are seeing a reduction in the malaria prevalence. And um, we are talking about malaria prevalence when we take microscopy of, of the blood samples from children and uh, it, we've seen a reduction from 27% in 2014 to this year, 14%. The, the results that will be shown will show that it's, it's reduced to 14%. Even though we are not having all the children sleeping under nets, we have seen an improvement in, in, in the net use. I won't, I'll leave you there as you, you, you feel um, ginger to listen to the rest of, of the presentation. I'm hoping that We'll make sure that the survey findings are made available to all health professionals. NMCP and the Ghana Health Service will do that. And um, I, I, before I, I end, I would want to say that Ghana Health Service is, holds this very important um, and it's dear to us being a member of part of the Ghana Health Service. The DG himself would have been here, but for another important meeting that he had to be playing a key role. Um, otherwise, you would have seen him here talking or same for the Minister of Health as well. So I want to give a special thanks for all those who have made it possible for this survey to be done. Ghana Statistical Service, DHS program, we appreciate your collaboration. And to my staff who worked relentlessly to make sure that the survey was done and also to make sure that the interventions that are needed for us to see the results today are implemented. I am grateful to you all. So let's all sit back and enjoy the sections, the presentations as they come. Thank you very much, Sally. Over. Thank you, Dr. Mom, for providing insight on how the survey measures and evaluates NMCP's vector control and malaria elimination interventions that have led to a reduction in malaria prevalence. Next, I'd like to introduce Ambassador Stephanie S. Sullivan to provide remarks. Uh, ambassador Sullivan arrived in Ghana at, as U.S. Ambassador on December 14th, 2018. She previously served as the political chief at the U.S. Embassy in Accra from 1997 to 2001. Her other overseas assignments were in the Republic of Congo, also as ambassador, and in Cameroon. Most recently, she was the acting principal deputy assistant secretary for the Bureau of African Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. After joining the State Department in 1986, she served multiple tours in the State Department's 24-7 briefing, briefing and Crisis Management Center. Other Washington assignments include Desk Officer for Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, as well as management positions supporting colleagues in Africa, Europe, and the Western Hemisphere. Uh, Ambassador Sullivan was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and she has degrees from Brown University and the National War College. She and her husband have two grown sons. Um, I hand it over to you, um, Ambassador. Thank you so much, Sally. Chairman for the events, Professor Kwadjo Ansa Koram, representative of the Ghana Statistical Service, Professor Samuel Kobina Anim, Program Manager of the National Malaria Control Program, Dr. Keza Mam, colleagues and partners, greetings. I'm very pleased to join you today for the outdooring of the 2019 Ghana Malaria Indicator Survey, MIS, results. On behalf of the United States government, I'm proud of our longstanding partnership with the government of Ghana 
to improve Ghanaians' health, including efforts to eliminate malaria. I'd like to give heartfelt thanks to the Ghana Statistical Service, the Ministry of Health, the Ghana Health Service, the National Malaria Control Program, and the National Public Health Reference Laboratory, who worked tirelessly to make the survey a success. Malaria continues to take a toll on the socioeconomic development of many countries across the world, especially those in Sub-Saharan Africa. Malaria increases healthcare spending, causes employees to miss work, and forces children to stay home from school, hindering their ability to acquire the knowledge and skills to thrive in the future. Through the President's Malaria Initiative, or PMI, the United States government partners with 27 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia to control and eliminate malaria. Since 2007, the United States has partnered with the government of Ghana to improve malaria treatment, control, and prevention. Our collaboration with Ghana aims to decrease malaria morbidity and mortality by encouraging the use of bed nets, preventing malaria in pregnancy, ensuring treatment is available across the country, and providing health workers with the knowledge and skills to properly manage the disease. Additionally, we support indoor residual spraying in Northern Ghana and seasonal malaria chemo prevention, which provides four rounds of preventive anti-malarial medicine to children under age five at the peak of the malaria transmission season. Together, we've achieved impressive results. To reiterate what Dr. Mom told us, between 2016 and 2019, just three years, the nationwide malaria prevalence in children aged six months to 59 months decreased from 21 to 14%. It's particularly exciting to see significant progress in Ghana's northern regions, with a decrease in malaria pre prevalence in children aged six to 59 months from 22 to 11% in the Upper West region, from 15 to 10% in the Upper East region, and from 25 to 13% in the Northern region. Aiko. The 2019 Ghana MIS represents the hard work of a talented team of technical experts from the government of Ghana and donor partners, including the Global Fund and PMI. The 2019 survey data combined with data from the 2008 and 2014 U.S. Agency for International Development supported demographic and health surveys and the 2016 Ghana MIS allow us to study trends and make evidence-based decisions to support Ghana's efforts to achieve malaria elimination and zero malaria deaths by 2030. These data will be critical to monitor progress and continuously improve efforts toward the sustainable development goals and Ghana's National Malaria Strategic Plan. From the 2019 MIS data, we've learned that over 90% of pregnant women take one or more doses of malaria preventive treatment in pregnancy, a dramatic increase from just 58% in 2008. However, only 61% of pregnant women receive the recommended three or more doses of this treatment. Also, 85% of children under five who took an anti-malarial drug took the recommended first-line treatment for uncomplicated malaria in Ghana, compared to only 59% in 2016. Through, though this is encouraging, there are a number of children with uncomplicated malaria who do not receive this treatment. Furthermore, while 74% of households reported owning a bed net, many did not use it. Only 43% of the household population reported that they had slept under a bed net the night before taking the survey. We have made progress, but still have a lot of work ahead. And we must continue to encourage Ghanaians to adopt healthy behaviors, such as regular bed net use and prompt testing and treatment of malaria to reduce the risk of serious illness and death. According to a Ghanaian proverb, there is bound to be a knot in a very long string. We must understand and address the knots or the core challenges impeding such behavior change and directly address these barriers. This work remains critical during the COVID-19 pandemic as we continue to monitor the impact of the virus on the continuity of essential services. In closing, I'd like to challenge each of us to take in the data, the bar charts, the graphs, the tables, and remember that behind each data point is a person 
a household, a family, a future. I challenge us to think of what these data mean in real terms to the mothers and fathers living in the Northeast or the Western regions who may not yet own a bed net or who may own one, but not yet sleep under it consistently. Especially in these times of COVID-19, we see that caregivers are hesitant to take their children to health facilities to get a critical malaria test when they have a fever. We're glad that the survey field work and analysis were complete before the spread of the pandemic. This enables us to tailor our COVID-19 response to adapt our approaches driven by data to ensure the continuity of these essential health services to save lives. Together, let's think about the practical solutions to fight malaria and what tangible role each of us can play. I look forward to the exciting presentations ahead and to continuing our partnership to achieve our common vision of a malaria-free Ghana. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Sullivan, for, pro pro for providing those remarks regarding the Ghana MIS and how malaria elimination is extremely critical during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next on our agenda is the 2019 Ghana Malaria Indicator Survey Key Findings presentation. We will have three presenters uh, uh, speak. The first uh, presentation will be made by Mr. Peter Pepra, Assistant Chief Statistician and Director of Field Operations of the Ghana Statistical Service. Mr. Pepra was the project coordinator for the GMIS survey. Mr. Pepper has been involved in DHS, MIS, and maternal health surveys implemented in Ghana as part of the DHS program since his first involvement in the 2002 service provision assessment. He is currently pursuing a PhD course in social studies at the University of Education, Winneba in Ghana. The second presentation will be made by Mr. Um, Samuel Opong of the National Malaria Control Program. He is a monitoring and evaluation specialist with the Ghana National Malaria Control Program. He coordinates monitoring and evaluation activities in vector control interventions, routine data quality audits, and seasonal malaria chemo prevention. He is involved in capacity building of national, regional, district, and health facility staff on capturing, reporting, and analyzing malaria-related data from routine health information systems, as well as other malaria data sources. He also leads capacity building programs of national, regional, and district staff on conducting data quality audits, as well as on-site training, supportive supervision on malaria data management. And our third um, and last presentation will be made by uh, Mr. Wajib Mohammed, Head of Surveillance, Monitoring and Evaluation at the Ghana National Malaria Control Program. He has been a member of the National Malaria Surveillance, Monitoring and Evaluation Technical Working Group since 2010, and has been involved in the implementation of DHS, MIS, and MIX surveys in Ghana since 2011. He's a member of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene since 2014. Um, so first, let's begin with um, Mr. Peter Pepra of GSS to begin his presentation. Peter, over to you. Thank you very much, Sally. And good afternoon, everyone. And good morning to those in the US. My presentation is basically focusing on the respondent characteristics so far as the 2019 Ghana Malaria Indicator Survey is concerned. The project, as we've heard, was implemented by Ghana Statistical Service. And uh, we work closely with the National Malaria Control Program and the Public Health Reference Lab. Next slide, please. Technical assistance was provided by the ICF, and as we heard from the government statistician, uh, fin uh, financial support also came from the USAID, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, and of course the government of Ghana. Next slide, please. 
the 2019 malaria indicator survey in Ghana is the second in series. The first one was conducted in 2016. And uh, the estimates that we are going to provide was basically driven by the design that focused on the, uh, that aimed at providing data at the national level and by urban rural and in each of the 10 administrative regions that existed at the time that we designed this survey. Uh, as I speak to you now, Ghana has 16 regions. That's the six new regions were carved out of an uh, existing region. So that's the northern and the brown half region. Next, please. The design of the study focused on the sampling frame of the 2010 population and housing census, where at the first stage of the selection, 200 uh, enumeration areas, which uh, we termed as clusters, were selected. And out of that, 97 were urban, and 103 were in rural. After the selection, an exercise we call listing of households was carried out in these 200 enumeration areas to ensure that we have a complete list of all households within these selected enumeration areas or clusters. The second stage of selection was uh, organized in such a way that 30 households were selected from each of the enumeration areas or clusters. And at the end of the day, we had uh, 6,002 6, households in that some had two households under one dwelling unit. So we had two of these and in total we had 6,002. But at the end of the day, 5,833 households responded, were met and uh, responded to the interview. In, in addition to that, they had we had complete questionnaire completed from these households, that's 5,833. Out of the selected households that I've mentioned, the focus was on women 15 to 49 years old. And uh, within these households where we have the women also, we targeted children six to 59 months and uh, uh, collected them some basic information about them with regards to malaria. Blood sample was also taken for anemia testing and malaria testing. Next slide, please. As we've heard, uh, anemia testing was carried out on children six to 59. And it was done using a finger or heel prick blood samples. And uh, a machine we called the portable homocube machine. The results were given to the parents of these children <coughs> by first uh, giving them verbal and a brochure which was left with them, at least with uh, the, the, the results being written on it. And uh, children who recorded hemoglobin level under eight grams uh, this liter were advised to take the children to health facility. And uh, they were given referral letter to show staff at a healthcare facility indicating or spelling out that an exercise like this has been carried out, but these children require or need attention or care. Next slide. On the part of malaria, the one before this, the one before, next to this, yeah. Within that same age bracket of the children, malaria testing was also carried out. And we had it in two perspectives or two phases. The first one was rapid diagnostic testing where blood sample taken uh, was um, tested for malaria. And within 15 minutes results were made available to parents 
Children who tested positive for malaria using the RDT were offered full course of treatment according to Ghana National Malaria Treatment Guidelines. And those, uh, later the sample, another sample was taken from the same prick point where thick blood smear was taken and sent to the reference lab, that's the National Public Health Reference Lab for testing and reading. Next. The survey had about 99% response rates with regards to the household interview. And likewise, at a women level, that's women 15 to 49, we also had response rates of 99%. We looked at certain characteristics of the women, next slide please. And including the characteristics is uh, the educational background of the women we interviewed. And uh, it came up that about 36% uh, of our women have, have either primary or no education. 28% has secondary or higher education. And 37% has GSS or GHS education. Basically, this is also to inform uh, uh, policy makers and the program, National Malaria Control Program, about how best they can package their messages for our women in case we, are, we make any attempt to put in interventions. Those with education, we know we can even use English or programs on radios or play. And those with no education, preferably maybe pictorial uh, uh, communication and using our local languages. So this gives us an idea about how best we can plan. And as I said, it's just one of the indicators in assessing how intervention, intervention can be packaged. Uh, I will end here with my presentation as my colleague uh, Samuel Opon take us through the malaria prevention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bipra. And uh, good afternoon to all. Good afternoon to Chairman and good afternoon to the Ambassador. So we will now look at uh, results of indicators related to malaria prevention, um, such as insecticide treated nets, where we look at the ownership and use. We also look at the malaria in pregnancy, indoor residual spraying. But we'll start with the uh, ITN indicators. So from the results, we've seen that three in four households in Ghana at least one insecticide um, ownership has increased over the years. And we are also seeing obviously that in rural areas there is more ownership of nets when you talk about households with at least one net compared to the urban households. Again, when it comes to universal coverage, which Ghana implemented since 2010-2012, uh, where in a particular household, you expect that two persons have at least one ITN. Um, we have the national average of uh, 52%. Uh, among the households in rural areas, we have 60% owning at least one ITN for two persons. And in the urban households, we have 44% of household owning at least one ITN for every two persons that you meet in the household. And that is what we call full household ITN coverage. And so we still have um, a long way to go because we expect to get 80% coverage when it comes to full LLIN or full ITN uh, coverage. Next, please. With respect to the regional distribution, and um, as the ambassador said, we are getting um, the northern regions coming up with higher ITN coverages. And when I say the northern regions, we talk about the northern region, the upper east region. So the upper east region has a ITN ownership among all the households as 88%, and the lowest being uh, Greater Accra, 
which is 56%. And we understand that net need in Greater Accra is not really, or the urban areas is not the same as when we find it in the rural areas. Next. In terms of ownership or the trends in ownership over the past years, from 2008 to the current result, which is 2009, we are having an appreciable increase of IT and um, ownership from 42% to 74%. Um, the margin between 2016 and 2019 is not really great, but then we think that we've done really pretty well because as you gear towards the ultimate coverage of 80 percent then you have it going slowly again when it comes to it and for every two persons we've improved from 17 percent in 2018 and now we are 52 percent and we think that with more effort to we'll be able to uh, achieve higher gains in the subsequent uh, uh, surveys that will be done but this also has to do with effective uh, communication strategies that we have to put in place to be able to get people to use the net. Right. Um, when it comes to the source of net, please, next slide. Sources of net. We ask households where they get their nets from. And from the data we had, majority of them get their nets from the mass campaigns that we did. And so we have uh, most of the households reporting that they got their nets from the 2018 mass campaign. Again, um, a few of them got it prior to the distribution period. But other channels where we get our nets or households got their nets is through the ANC school distribution and immunization. And so we think that the next, the, the next campaigns or the PND, the point my distribution serves as a main source of getting net into households. Next. We looked at among households, where are the, where do the nets go? Where do the nets go? We realize that 26% of households do not have any net. And so it justifies the fact that we still need more uh, net into the system. Because we have 74% ownership, but we have net, but then this presupposes that on the reverse, 26% don't have nets. Again, more than half, which is 52% of households have one ITM for every two persons. And if we are supposed to get it to the universal coverage, then we realize that we don't have enough nets for all households. Again, we've seen that at least one ITM, uh, when it comes to one ITM for every household, 22% um, do not have the net. So that's also one thing that we have to really uh, focus on as a program. Next. We come to access to an ITN. We realized that from 20, 2008, access to ITNs have increased. We started from 30%, and now in 2019, we are 67%. Access is that are enough net available if households members want to use the net. We realized that in 60%, 67% of the households people or household members have access to the net. But then when it comes to the use, we are not doing so much well as the ambassador said. From 21% in 2008, we are now talking about 43% use. But we think that we should be able to get um, a bit higher. Once the nets are available, we should be getting people to use it. And this relationship between the assets and the use usually a behavioral change issues. And so this is also one of the things we are finding out in this survey. That we should be able to impress on people that once you have the net, you should be able to use it. Next, please. We now want to look at the ITN use among children under five. And we realize that, again, um, 
the ITN use coverage for the national coverage is 54%. So when you pick a uh, children under five in Ghana, we have 54% of those surveyed sleeping under nets the previous night. The highest we've realized is in Brongahafo region, or which is the old Brongahafo region. And the lowest, as uh, previously mentioned, is uh, Greater Accra region, which has only 25% of children using nets the previous night before the survey. Next. In terms of trends, looking at children under five use of nets and pregnant women use of nets, we realize that um, there's been an increase, but then the, the, the increase is not really so much uh, great. From 39% in 2008, we are now at 54%. When it comes to pregnant women, we moved from 27% to 2008 to 49%. And I must say that between 2016 and 2000, we have seen slight drop in the usage rates, which uh, the program is still working on to make sure that we improve on this, especially with the use among the pregnant women. We went further to also look at what are the reasons why people don't use nets. Next slide, please. In our, in, in, in the survey, we realized that 50% of nets which households have were not used the previous night. It means that half were used, half were not used. We try to find reasons why somebody will own a net but not use it. And so we realized that most of them said the nets that they had, or the particular net that was not used, was an extra net. So in that sense, they were saving it to be used later. Others also give, gave some reasons as it's too hot, and so I didn't use this net. Others also said they prefer other methods. 4% um, said nets were being washed and dried. Another said there are still chemicals which are unsafe. But majority indicated that the nets were, were there and then they were using it or they were saving it for later. Next slide, please. When it comes to indoor residual spraying, which in Ghana we know is predominantly done in the northern regions. And, or let me say specifically Upper West, the whole of the region is implementing IRS. When it comes to Upper East, we have only three districts out of the 15 districts implementing. The old northern region, which was formerly um, 26 districts, we have only seven districts implementing these IRS. In Ashanti region, we have Oboasin and Inton Barons also implementing IRS. And so when we asked households who have been able to receive IRS over the past four months, we realized that 90% of households in Upper West region really had benefited from IRS. When it comes to Upper East, we had 15% and Northern region, 30%. But we also understand that there are pockets of IRS going on across the country, some individually and some as corporate social responsibilities. And so you still have some um, regions reporting that, or some households in other regions reporting that they really benefited from an IRS um, activity in their households. Next, please. Then we looked at uh, IPTP. So IPTP, we've seen um, appreciable increase in IPTP coverages, especially the IPTP1, which we've seen the country moving from 58% in 20, 2008 to 91%. And uh, we have also seen in terms of IPT2, which used to be um, a policy for the country until it was changed IPT3, we have it being at 80% in 2019. When it comes to IPT3, which is not a recommended number of doses, minimum number of doses a woman, a pregnant woman should take, we had a, an increase from 28% in 2008 to 61% in 2019. And I should say that we've not really had a huge jump between 2000 and 
2016 and 2019. But it is really looking at women with live births um, two years uh, before the survey. And so we think that subsequently we have to really do things to improve that positive coverage. I will now hand over to my colleague Wajib to also present data results on case management and behavioral change communication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sami. Now we will look at the results of indicators related to management of fever and malaria in children and then behavior change communication. Fever in children. Next slide. In the two weeks before the survey, 30% of children under five had fever, the primary symptom of malaria. Treatment was sought for 69% of children with recent fever, while only 34 had blood taken from a finger or heel for testing. 46% of children with recent fever took an anti-malaria drug. Next slide. Now the trend in case, of case management of fever and malaria in children. Treatment seeking has declined from 77% in 2014 to 69% in 2019. Diagnostic testing has stagnated since 2014, as we can see from 34, 30 to 34%. Next slide. What are the most common anti-malaria drugs used from the 46% that we saw the fever cases? Atomicin combination therapy, ACT, is the recommended drug for treating malaria in children under five, in children in Ghana. Among children under five with fever in the two weeks before the survey who received the anti-malaria, 85% received recommended treatment, followed by amodiaquil, which is the second most frequently taken medicine for children with malaria. This is an improvement from the 59% in 2016 who took ACTs. Next slide. The prevalence of hemoglobin, of low hemoglobin has decreased from 19% in 2008 to 7% in 2016 and a further reduction to 4% in 2019. Next slide. The great news coming from the survey is that we have reduced malaria prevalence. Malaria prevalence has declined from 27% in 2014 to the current levels of 14% in 2019. Next slide. Let's look at the reduction in prevalence with respect to residents. Malaria prevalence according to the microscopy, which is the gold standard for diagnostics of malaria, is more than three times higher among rural children than urban children. The results we're seeing is comparable to the same trend in 2016 as urban reduced from 11% in 2016 to 6% in 2019 and rural from 28% to 20% in 2019. Next slide. Let's look at the regional variations of the prevalence. Now, almost all the regions have reduced between 2016 to 2019, with the exception of Western region, which increased from 24% in 2016 to 27% in 2019. The three northern regions, which used to be the highest burden, have reduced consistently over the years, with Upper West reducing from 22% to 11%, Upper East 15%, 15% to now 10%, and the Northern region from 25% to 13%. Greater Accra has always been the lowest and reduced from 5% in 2016 to 2%. Let's look at the malaria prevalence as it relates to wealth. Malaria prevalence decreases with increasing wealth from 22% among the poorest households to 2% among the wealthiest households. This continues to emphasize on the relationship between malaria and wealth. Now, we finally look at malaria knowledge and communication. 
Next slide. Overall, next slide please. Overall, 59% of women aged 15 to 49 have seen or heard a malaria message in the six months before the survey. Urban women are more likely than rural women to have seen or heard a malaria message. This is however an improvement from the 46% of those who have heard the malaria message in 2016 as compared to 2019, which is 50, 59%. Similar increases was observed in both the rural and urban district. What are the various sources of malaria message? Next slide. Among the women who had seen or heard the malaria message in the six months before the survey, television was the most commonly cited source of information. This was followed by radio, health worker, and word of mouth. Next slide, please. The exposure to specific malaria messages. Next slide, please. Okay. Among women who have heard or seen a message about malaria, 93% had been exposed to at least one of the seven specific messages about malaria. Well, 72% hearing about sleep and an insecticide treated mosquito net always test before treating and malaria kills. These were the common malaria messages cited by the respondents. How about the knowledge on specific ways to prevent malaria? Next slide. A slide before that. Right. So women were asked about things that they can do to prevent malaria. The majority of the women cited sleeping under mosquito nets or an ITN, that's about 79%, as a way of preventing themselves from getting malaria, followed by keep the surroundings clean, fill stagnant water, spray house with an insecticide. Now, in, in May, 2019, the Ministry of Health and Ghana Health Service, with support from WHO and PATH, introduced the RTSS and the RTSS malaria vaccine into the routine immunization schedule through phase malaria implementation program. Next slide, please. Next. The vaccine was introduced subnationally in three regions, Bronga Hafo, Central Region, Border region. The 2019 Malaria Indicator Survey took the opportunity to ask about the malaria vaccine knowledge and attitude. And these are, and these are the results. The women that were asked if they had heard about malaria vaccine and if they would allow their children to be vaccinated against malaria. One in three women have heard about the malaria vaccine and nine in 10 women would allow their child to be vaccinated against malaria. This concludes the key findings. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you presenters. Um, I think that was a wonderful job presenting the key findings from the Ghana uh, Malaria Indicator Survey. And we have a lot of questions um, in our uh, Zoom chat pod. Um, so at this time, um, I ask that our chairperson, um, uh, Professor Kuram and um, Peter Pepra of GSS um, moderate the Q&A discussion, um, which we will go um, hopefully until about um, 2.45 to then go into a stack compiler demonstration to visualize Ghana MIS data. Um, over to the chairman and um, Peter Pepra. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, Peter, good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, uh, Prof. I think what I'll try to do is, um, I'll go to the beginning of the chat and then start to read off some of the questions. And um, I'll try and see whether I could group similar questions. It's not been easy doing that, but I'll try. And then I'll ask the presenters to give brief answers. I understand we have until, uh, what is it, 
2.45 to wind up. So um, what the first questions that I see, some of them have been answered. I mean, I think so. There was a question about somebody asking why the proportions were more than 100, but it was uh, due to rounding error. And I think it was indicated on the slide also. Uh, there's a question here about why was it targeted to women, but not men? So maybe, Peter, you could, or maybe, no, the malaria control program people could answer, tell us why the target is the women and not the men. Hello? Can you hear Maggie. me? Yes, hello? Yes. Why was yes, the survey sorry. limited to women? Okay, so, so generally the survey was actually admission questionnaire to, um, it was not limited, it was limited to the household, but questions were asked to women of reproductive age, normally. Uh, that's about 15 to 49 years, who are you know, the caregivers of children. So th this is why normally there's a household service actually asks questions to this group of um, 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 uh, respondents. Okay, so did you get any men answering your questions or is just... Because when uh, Peter was presenting, I think he did allude to the fact that this was targeted at women. Yeah, Prof, let me add something to what uh, Wajib has said. Um, malaria, as we all know, is a disease that most of the time our uh, women in the reproductive age bracket or pregnant women, let me put it that way, and our children are the most vulnerable. And therefore, the study has been uh, planned to target women and see how best interventions can be put in place. Because if our mothers or during pregnancy, if they are not infected with mosquito, sorry, malaria parasites, they are more likely to be healthy throughout the cycle of the pregnancy and likewise, the children are also more likely to be healthy because we've realized our evidence shows that most of the time, uh, mothers who carry uh, malaria through their pregnancies do have children with low weight and, uh, other, uh, and, and the children also become anemic and they become prone to other diseases. So as the project is planned by ICF, globally, the, there is always the interest of targeting women during their pregnancy period, and therefore the children as well. That's why men were left out so far as this project is concerned. Uh, thank you. I think we can move on. There is a question on how does the prevalence that we found here compare with ITN coverage, especially in areas with very low net coverage, such as Greater Accra. And if they are not using nets, that's in this, those places with low prevalence, what are they using to protect themselves from malaria? Okay, so I would I would attempt to add, add, um, to respond to that, and then um, uh, Doctor Doctor Maum Sami can come in to add on. So basically, what we have noticed over the years is that urban malaria is normally lower as compared to the rural, and urbanization, just like we notice, wealth and development has something to do with the severity or the, the prevalence of malaria. So if you look at Greater Accra, for instance, they have twenty five percent use of ITN yet they are the lowest when it comes to the prevalence. What I tell is that the urbanization that is happening around uh, in Greater Accra contributes more to the, uh, the areas not being favorable or more or less to the disease, uh, malaria. So this is, this is how, if you want to link the net users against, that's why when Sami was presented, he says, these are areas where net use culture is not really a big cause. People are a bit urbanized and they, they believe they live in a very uh, less more prone. Areas. So this is what I can say, but 
Dr. Mam and Sami, you can add on. Thank you. I think you've answered the question quite well, but just to add, um, it, just, it just shows that the malaria prevalence is not only limited to the use of ITN. So there are other factors that can lead to the reduction of malaria prevalence beyond the use of ITS. But all things being equal, if all those other factors are equal across, then when you use an ITN, you are more likely not to be affected by malaria. Um, you realize that in the regions where there's indoor residual spraying, we've seen um, also reduction in the malaria prevalence. So just to add to what Wajib said. Thank you. Um, this question was answered already. The reason for excluding men. Uh, the, other, the next one will be uh, what methods that we're not told in the methods, the eligibility criteria for the survey, but then later saw some people being eligible. What makes the rest ineligible? And also data on accessibility to the net, but didn't see that of utilization. I thought the utilization was also presented, if I may be, I'm not mistaken. But what were the eligibility criteria for the respondents? Yeah, Prof, let me pick it up. Okay. Um, in my submission of, yeah, let me put it that way. In my submission, it was made clear that we targeted women in the reproductive age bracket, 15 to 49. And uh, so these women in the selected households became eligible for the study and the next level which is children under five the cutoff was six months to 59 months so these were the eligible eligibility criteria so in each household or yeah in whatever in all the households or households with children in the age bracket six to 59 months the children became eligible automatically and all households where we have women 15 to 49, month, uh, 49 years, those women also became eligible. So that's the filtration, first household, and then within the household, women 15 to 49, and within the women uh, in this bracket also, those who have children six to 59 months, those children became eligible for the study. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um... Okay, then there is the issue of using net use, which is a very sort of uh, broad indicator. Uh, what are the strategic activities that are put in place to ensure high usage of the net? Otherwise, it will be a waste when nets are distributed and people are not using them. I don't know what the program will say, but I mean, this has always been an issue. You do give it to them, they buy. Those who buy them probably are more likely to use and uh, we're not so clear as to when we go on our campaigns and things and distribute what, are, what is the motivation to continue to use them. But um, we, we've always found that uh, ownership and usage, there's always a gap between the ownership and the usage. So as a program, people could shed some light on this. Some more light on this. Okay, Prof. So um, I, I think th that's the point. I just want to, I don't know if it's a question from Emmanuel. I just want to correct something that this um, difficulty in terms of ownership and usage has not led to an increase in malaria prevalence. I think maybe it was, was an error. And one of the things that we've always been doing and we continue to do is to make people understand why they have to use the net so that that gap will, would be minimized. As, as we, we've seen uh, mostly, except this year in the pregnant women, it both keep increasing. If you look at the graph, that's what should. So both are increasing, but there's always a gap. So it, it, it means that whatever we are doing is leading to an increase in both indicators, but we've still not been able to close that gap. And I'm, I don't know if we'll ever be able to close that gap. What we want to do is to narrow that gap 
as much as possible. And we do that by continuous behavior change communication. Okay. Um, what is the next one that we can look at? There's a question about comparing the prevalence at antenatal care and immunization, which is at 6% and 3%, and whether uh, this could be looked at in the light of continuous distribution of LLIs through the channels. I'm not sure the survey really set out to address this, but uh, what are your views of this? Um, hello, Prof. So, hello. Um, yes. yes, I'm not sure we, we related the ITM to prevalence, because um, prevalence, we didn't have it in um, pregnant women and, um, and children of five. This was just done in the children of five. But I see where the question is coming from. So there was this chart of sources of nets, where we realized that majority of the nets have been have been gotten from mass campaign, which was 67%. And okay. then the other channels were relatively lower. And so, but the, 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 the group which responded to this also should be put in focus because these are women who have um, live birth in the past two weeks, in the past three years, sorry, uh, who are responding to this. And, but what we found out was that a few of them said they got their nurse from the health facilities. And a few of them also said that their children got a nurse from um, the doses. But um, the, the point is that these are also avenues which we top up nets into the households. So they are not really main channels for getting nets into the household, but then they are um, channels within which we can keep up net uh, sustainabilities within the household. So there are still vital channels through which we can still get net into the households, apart from the main mass campaign where we try to cover everybody within the household. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question from Sylvester about extra net as a reason for non-use of ITN. This is confusing. I, I'm not sure I get what is going on here, but maybe the presenters understand what he's trying to get at. He says, what was the question asked? Was well, there a slide on extra net as a reason for non-use of ITNs? Uh, so, um, so, so, yeah, so um, Prof, th this was also seen. Uh, um, apparently the question that um, the possible answers that, that was given in the instrument was, why is this net not used? And among the reasons was this is an extra net, or probably I'm saving I'm saving this for later use. And so, okay. yeah, th those those were put together in the instrument. So it's either the net is an extra net which I'm, I don't have use for it now. I'm keeping it for later use, and that is why we have that uh, response. But then the question is, is the person using a net? So yes. this is sort of a surplus to requirement. Yes, yeah, so these are nets which were not used. So unfortunately, um, the way the design went, we are not able to really dichotomize between um, the person, whether this person already slept under a net, but then these additional nets is saving for later. But then we actually looked at the proportion of nets which were not used, 50% uh, of the nets which were not used, what was the reasons why these nets were not used? And what came up was that these nets um, really is an extra net. But uh, okay. there is also room for further analysis of this data for the country to be able to um, take more information and then be able to plan ahead. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. There's a question on whether the increase in IPTP, the SP coverage, um, whether that was established using secondary data or this was collected during the field, field during the survey. Okay. Again, probably uh, if I can answer this question. So this was also from survey, and so. Okay. 
among the women that responded to this, and we are talking about women of reproductive age, 15 to um, 49 years. And I think Mr. Pepper indicated what is the eligibility criteria. So you should have had a live birth within this period of reference. And we ask that within your live birth, did you really take an SP? And then okay. if you say yes, we ask uh, how many times did you take the SP? And, and I think that, that that is the result we have. Thank okay. You. And uh, another question on the time for recall. In the two weeks, uh, how was in the two weeks in the context of the survey defined as this has potential for varied interpretations? Yeah, Prof. Yes. Uh, as we saw, data collection was between September and November. Okay. Yeah, so we spent 60 days for data collection. So as the household, uh, the enumerators visits the household, the two weeks is calculated from the day of interview retrospectively. So okay. that's how we came about the two weeks. No, I think that's fair. And there's a question from the Facebook uh, interface. How were the ages of children without official documents determined? Uh, what is the chance to have the exact age of precision? So those who did not have uh, like child welfare cards and things, how were their ages determined? Hello, Prof. I'm here. Yeah, Peter will take it. Okay. Um, we relied on about three documents. One is the child welfare book, two, the uh, birth certificates, if available, and three. Three is um, the mother either telling you or, you know, when, when women are also going for, when they are pregnant, they go for antenatal care. So we also use the antenatal care book to guide in estimating the ages of those whose ages, uh, whose, who did not have documents to confirm their ages. But I can quickly add that this wasn't significant in the sense that most cases you get a child welfare books, in most cases. On few occasions that personally I observed something the book wasn't with the mom, but they called the father and the man checked the book. So there were a few instances that they may be, maybe the, the book wouldn't be at home, but we made extra effort to get closer or the correct age for the child. In some cases also, if they have um, uh, siblings, we looked at, we interacted with the mom to know the gap or the age interval between them so that we can get children within the age bracket we targeted. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a series of questions on um, something about improving the child scheme. I think that will be worked on. And then some things about the transmission overall. There's one about a 10% reduction in the forest region and like a shanty region. I think the person thinks, uh, he says it's counterintuitive uh, the northern, upper east, and upper west region seems to be doing quite well. Can this be partly attributed to the implementation of SMC? Um, yeah. And then why aren't people using nests in the urban areas? What is accounting for that? If we could take these three together. Okay, so let me let me help. And Dr. Pepra is also online, so he can also um, help with the other questions as they come. Um, yes, partly we wouldn't say it's solely due to SMC, but all the interventions that are being implemented in these um, regions can be said to attribute to the reductions that we are seeing. Um, 
why aren't people using nets in the urban areas? I think the reasons were shown in, in, the, in, the, in the presentation with the people saying it's too hot. One of the things we also see in the urban areas is that they generally tend to have other options in terms of controlling or feel that they have other options, especially when it comes to housing. So the reasons we have got officially is what was, was shown on the slides, the feeling of it being too hot or having an extra net. And then the question of the upper, the northern regions, upper east, upper west, northern region, uh, reducing the, the reduction in the prevalence, can it be partly attributed to the implementation of SMC? I think I just answered to that one. Yes, it can be partly, partly. Okay, so as part of all. children under five. There's oh. another. Hello. Sorry, let me read this question, and let's see if we can get an answer to that. Okay. How do we compare these findings to routine data on dimes two? And why the drop in the use of ITN by pregnant women from 2016 to 2019? Okay. Um, let me tackle the second one. Maybe why the why we the would leave it to. Very good. Okay, Dr. Wang, please. Doctor, Mr. Pram, I'm struggling to see the. You said why the drop? I missed the first part of the question. So yeah, the first part of the question is how do we compare these findings to routine data on dimes two? Dims on dims two. Uh, yeah, so, sorry, dims. Uh, in terms of the indicators, um, there are some which are comparable, others which are not. So if we look at generally our indicators in DIMS in terms of um, number of cases in malaria, seen in malaria, we are not seeing that much of a reduction. But when it comes to death, when it comes to admissions, we are seeing the reduction. Um, even with the confirmed malaria cases, we are not seeing that um, reduction as expected. But what we see compared to the, which compares to the test, um, to the prevalence, is the test positivity rate of, of the cases that we, we record in the health facility. That means of those who are taken to test for malaria, how many are really positive? And we are seeing a reduction in that. So that compares to the parasite prevalence um, that we are seeing. For something like IPTP, what we've generally seen over the years is that our survey um, results are usually yeah. higher than what we Come see in. in the routine information, which is the DIMS. And one of the things we have attributed to this difference is the issues and challenges around data recording and reporting in our health facilities because of the way the IPTP is tallied and eventually aggregated and reported. All right, thank you for very much. The second part of the question is, why the drop in the use of ITN by pregnant women from 2016 to 2019? Okay, so first of all, I, I won't say that it's very marginal. It's a 1% drop, even though we would have preferred to see an increase and and we would do further analysis to understand why in particular the pregnant women we are seeing the, the result because the study right away doesn't give us the, the um, answer. Sure. Peter, can you go on with the rest of the questions till our time is up? We have about 10 minutes more. All right, I'm going through to Uh, I think you could start mm -hmm. from. There's a question, Peter, yeah. if you don't mind, from Honka, right. I think. Yes, it says the results presented show an inverse relationship between the prevalence and level of wealth. 
this presents evidence of inequity overall with our interventions, which is typical with most population level interventions. Going forward, how do the GHS and NMCP hope to avoid intervention generated inequity that is associated with most population level interventions? And I read this because of the point on the inequity and I think uh, I, yes, there is a difference in the prevalence with wealth. Generally, malaria is associated with poor, um, with poverty. A number of reasons have been thought about. It, it includes housing, it includes access to healthcare, it, it, it includes um, your ability to even fight the disease. In terms of the population level interventions, which in our case, or for malaria control, has to do with indoor residual sprain, um, distribution of ITS, seasonal malaria chemo prevention. The data, as has been shown, doesn't show that there is inequity um, tilted in the same direction of the prevalence. So um, that is not the reason why we ask, because as you saw, we have higher um, nets in the, in the uh, poor people or the, the rural areas. And in fact, if they had shown it in the lower quintiles to you see more nets, it's the same for indoor residual spring and it's the same for seasonal malaria chemo prevention. So um, there are other things that we need to do. That's why we've added on the intervention of the larval source management to try and see um, if that will also improve um, malaria reduction in um, these other areas, these areas of low wealth. All right, thank you. Dr. Mam, uh, uh, the next question, I would appreciate you pick it up for us. And it reads, Dr. Mam mentioned that Ghana is recording a drop in the prevalence rate. Per the survey, which key pointers are responsible for the drop in prevalence rate? So the thing about malaria is there's no single magic bullet. And all the interventions we are doing are um, contributing to the reduction that we are seeing. What we can say is that you can see there's reduction in some regions more than other regions. So if that's the case where we try to differentiate which interventions are going on in these regions as compared to the other. What we've seen is that um, interventions like indoor residual spring, seasonal malaria chemo prevention is quite effective. But going back, we've also seen reduction in prevalence even when we didn't have these interventions, where we were using the in insecticide treated net. So we think it's a combination of all the in um, interventions that we are, we are putting in place. That is why we are seeing the drop in malaria prevalence. All right, thank you very much. And there is this question also that reads, it was intriguing during the presentation on the treatment of malaria for children under five years. We had chloroquine as a response. Please, how come we still have that in the country for treatment? Uh, so, I try to see, I'm a seeing person, but <laughs> I'm not able to identify the question. If I had right, it's talking about chloroquine. As a country, yeah. we don't use chloroquine again for the treatment of malaria. You may have chloroquine on the market for something else because chloroquine is used for things like rheumatoid, um, at, at, yes, the autoimmune diseases. So um, as a country, we don't use chloroquine anymore for malaria treatment. All right, thank you very Did much. Did I answer the question, Peter? Yes, yes. Um, I think we'll go to the Are there some hands up? Up for a long time. We have um, about Ali. four more.
more minutes for any questions. Um, otherwise, um, I think there is someone who may be trying to ask one. Yes, uh, well, I, know, so I asked the question, but no response. Can you please repeat please, your question? Please, what was the question, please? Yeah, my question was, why are the presenters still using the word IT and instead of LLIN that we have in the country? Or are there some areas that still have the ITN, whereas others have LLIN? That's my question. Mr. Pong, would you pick it up, please? Okay, all right. So, so thank you. Um, I think the general broad term is an ITN. And from um, when the days that we used to have a short term ITN, that is a retreatable net, we had to distinguish between the long lasting and the retreatable net. But now, worldwide, we phased out the retreatable net. So, every net is now basically a long lasting net, but the broader name is an insecticide um, treated net. And so once we have all nets becoming an alliance, then we revert back to the term an ITN, which basically becomes a broader term encompassing um, all nets that are treated with uh, insecticides. But basically when you see an ITN from 2016, Ghana, all the nets that we had in the country was uh, an LLIN. And so we are comfortable saying an ITN because basically it is the same thing as an LLIN. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sally, could you please pick it up? Uh, yes, thank you, Peter. And thank you everyone for your thoughtful and informative questions. I hope this conversation moves beyond today and that you continue to um, question and ask about the data. As many people um, mentioned today, what we're what we're presenting today is the descriptive data that the results of the Ghana malaria indicator survey show. Um, but later, to, later, we will show you how you can download um, and access the data set where you can do further analysis of the data set um, to maybe look deeper into these uh, questions that you have. I am also going to show you a, um, a way to, to visualize this data. So uh, Josh, the next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, for the next few minutes, I'm going to demonstrate uh, the DHS program Stack Compiler. Um, I think we'll, we'll share the link to Stack Compiler in the chat pod. Um, the Stack Compiler is a website that permits users of malaria indicator survey and demographic and health survey data to conduct their own preliminary explorations with data. The web address is stackcompiler.com. Um, today, we will learn how to access Stack Compiler select countries and indicators and build a data table and then finally visualize Ghana MIS data in a column chart, line graph and thematic map. So let me um, share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, um, this is um, Stack Compiler works best in Google Chrome or Mozilla Firefox web browsers. Enter the web address stackcompiler.com uh, and you'll see the welcome screen, sc screen that you see here. Stack Compiler can be used in either English or French up here in the top hand right hand corner. Um, what Stack Compiler has is more than 2,500 standard indicators from more than 90 countries. Um, you can explore indicators by background characteristics or trends. If possible, I recommend that you follow along using Stack Compiler yourself on a separate screen or device. If you are following along uh, using Stack Compiler, let me know by clicking the green yes um, next to your name, check mark, that way uh, I know you are following along. Um, or you can give me a red check mark if you are unable to follow along. Um, you can also practice with um, Stack Compiler uh, using our guided help function, which is here at the bottom of the screen. 
The first step in using Stack Compiler is to select one or several countries. So if you come over here to the right hand side and choose country, um, you can always change the selection either uh, at later at the in your use. But Stack Compiler automatically uh, presents a list of all possible countries, but you can also filter this list by region. So if I come up here, I will click Western Africa and I will get a list of uh, Western African countries. Uh, the number to the right of the country indicates the number of surveys um, available. So you see Ghana's name here and that there are eight surveys next to uh, Ghana, which means there are there's a lot of data available. Uh, for this example, we're going to explore Ghana, and I'm also going to select all um, Western African countries, um, and then I will click Next. Once I have um, selected my countries, you will be directed to select your indicators of interest. The indicators are generally ordered similarly to the order of final, a DHS final reports. There are three tabs here. The first tab is common indicators, and this lists about 20 of the most popular indicators from DHS and MIS surveys. Um, <clears throat> the second tab, um, indicators by tag, um, groups indicators by keywords. For example, um, two COVID-19 tags um, help users to identify uh, indicators to help contextualize the COVID-19 crisis in countries. And, and for a complete list of uh, DHS and MIS indicators, uh, you'll come to this list, <clears throat> uh, complete list, and you can also search um, by um, keyword. So I'll search for malaria, and you can see that um, there are some um, uh, indicators that pop up. Uh, for this uh, demonstration, I'm going to select two indicators to demonstrate for you today. The first one will be use of mosquito nets by children, um, which is children under five who slept under an IT insecticide treated net or ITN. Uh, you, you have to scroll over here using the scroll bar at the bottom to read the full name of the indicator. And the second indicator I will select is malaria prevalence according to microscopy. Once you've selected all your indicators, you can select next. Um, Stack Compiler, you can always add more countries and more indicators at a later time. After you've selected countries and indicators, the table view will appear. The standard setting is for the table to include all selected indicators for all surveys. Um, depending on your needs, this first table may contain too much information, but you can customize it. See, we have a long list of countries here. Um, so to display only the most recent survey from each country, um, I come here to the bottom and click on recent in the bottom left-hand corner. And um, you can, or uh, if you're interested in a specific uh, time period, you can come over here to custom and, and then you can select the, uh, or deselect the surveys um, that you don't want to show. Okay. Um, if at any moment you want to add indicators, you come over here on the right of your screen to indicators and click on the pencil icon. This allows you to, the pop-up of the select indicators, the three tabs shows up again, so you can add more indicators if you'd like. If you want to uh, minimize some countries here, you can uh, deselect some of the countries that are being shown, um, or you can add new countries if you come up here to the list and it'll show up again. Okay. You can explore indicators by background characteristics. So here uh, in the right hand side underneath indicators, you can uh, explore this table by age, uh, by residence, um, sex, wealth, quintile, age and months, and region. So I want to click region here. So you can see the um, regional data that we have uh, specifically for uh, Ghana. You can see that we do have the regional data here as well. Okay. So the next thing that I want to show you in Stack Compiler is um, how you can visualize data in a column chart. Uh, click on the column chart icon at the top left of the screen right here, this column chart. Um, and the column chart allows users to visualize a comparison among several countries 
or by background characteristics. This view does not allow users to display one, more than one indicator at a time. So what you need to do is you'll have to, over here in the indicator section, you will click the down arrow to toggle back and forth in between the indicators that you have already selected. Um, so I'm going to select malaria prevalence. And here you can see um, that when you select malaria prevalence, um, we also include the confidence intervals um, for uh, the surveys. Um, if you've created a great visualization, um, oh, also you can do the same background characteristics in the table view as you can here um, in, um, um, uh, in the column chart. So I want to look at, um, malaria prevalence according to wealth. And here I, um, if I want to just focus uh, on uh, Ghana, I can deselect the other countries um, to get my, um, just the Ghana information. Uh, if you've created a great visualization, don't stop there. If you come up here into the top uh, right hand, uh, very, very top of your screen, you can share this with your network or social media uh, friends. Uh, so you can email it, Facebook, tweet it. Also this orange box, if you click on here, will give you the web address or URL uh, to the specific visualization that you have made. So you can copy and save your work. Um, another thing that you can do is export um, your visualization as a PDF or as a ping. A ping is an image file. And once you've, um, if you click export as a ping, uh, you can uh, customize your visualization. And then I, when I export it, um, I am given, um, if you can, hopefully you can see this, it's a, an image, a ping, that I can add into any report um, that I'd like to, uh, to display. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask a poll question to everyone who is still listening. Um, I want to know if there's a pattern in malaria prevalence among Ghanaian children aged 6 to 59 months by wealth quintile. Okay. Is there a pattern in malaria prevalence among Ghanaian children aged 6 to 59 months by wealth quintile? Um, you should see here, this is um, malaria prevalence according uh, to wealth. Um, and I'm hoping that we're getting some responses. I see a few. Um, to easily find the answer, um, you select wealth quintile in Stack Compiler. And then you can um, uh, visualize Ghana and deselect other countries if you want. I'm, I'm getting some uh, good responses here. Um, so I think um, if we can... The majority of people are getting the correct answer, so let's end the polling. Um, so you can see that um, the majority answered it correctly. Yes, that malaria prevalence decreases with increased household wealth from 22.4% in the lowest wealth quintile uh, to 2.1% in the highest wealth quintile. The next thing you can do in Stack Compiler is view your data in a line graph. So I'm going to come up here in the top left corner, click the line graph. I'm going to deselect wealth quintile. And you can see that line graphs are an excellent choice for showing historical trends. This customization option for this view are the same as for the column charts. You can still um, you know, add background characteristics and add countries. You're not allowed to view one indicator, more than one indicator at a time. Um, so now I want to ask another poll question, is how has malaria prevalence changed um, over time among children aged 60 to 59 months in Ghana by residents. How has malaria prevalence among children aged 6 to 59 months changed over time in Ghana by residents? So I will, to easily find this answer, I will select residents as my background uh, characteristic. Um, all the other countries are deselected, so I can just focus on Ghana. I, I want to encourage participation here. How has malaria prevalence among children aged 6 to 59 months changed over time in Ghana by residents? So here you should see um, that the malaria prevalence has declined in Ghana. Uh, so the, the blue line is the total. 
Uh, so we can see that it's declined from 26.7% um, to 14.1% in 2019. And you can also see urban, which is the orange line, and rural, which is the green line, have also declined uh, in the same time period. So if we end the polling, we will see that most of you did get the correct answer and that malaria prevalence has declined in Ghana and in urban and rural areas. The last thing I want to show you in Stack Compiler is up, up here, if we click on the uh, map, thematic map, uh, we can visualize um, uh, Ghana MIS data uh, on at a national or sub-national level, okay? So in this view, we're looking at, I would like to change this to malaria prevalent, um, to children under five who slept under an ITN. And when I, click on the, the country, I will get a pop-up window that shows me the trends available for this, um, for this country. So you can see the trend, the increasing in, um, increased use of um, ITNs among children under five from 3.9% uh, in 2003 to 54.1% in 2019. If I want to look at the sub-national level, um, here, I will come over here under the map functionality and switch to subnational, and you can see that um, it has broken it down into the regions of the 2019 Ghana MIS survey. So I have a, my last poll question for uh, everyone is which region in Ghana has the lowest percentage of ITN use among children under five? Which region in, in Ghana has the lowest percentage of ITN, ITN use among children under five? So I think as you are answering this, the, the easier way to find this answer is to click on one of the regions and you'll see that a pop-up window will appear. So I'm going to click on these light orange areas because I know these, these are at the legend over here, it's telling me it's the lowest use. So when I click on um, greater Accra, you will see that I see each of the 10, each of the regions with their values and the red line representing the national um, percentage. So here, uh, I think I have revealed the answer and most of you have gotten it correct, is that um, Greater Accra region has the lowest ITN use among children under five at 24.7%. Okay. So now um, you've learned how to uh, visualize uh, MIS data in Stack Compiler. And so in summary, um, you have learned how to access Stack Compiler, select countries and indicators, and build a data table, um, as well as visualize MIS data um, with column charts, line graphs, and maps. So my last question will be, how many of you plan on using Stack Compiler to further explore Ghana MIS data? Please give me a yes, a uh, green check mark if you are. Um, because we want to, uh, I'm, I would be really excited to see and hope that people use this. Um, but for our very last thing, I'm going to hand this over to the chairman um, for to talk about the release of the Ghana MIS publications. Hello. Hello, are you hearing me? I'm having some challenges with my connectivity. Yes, we hear you. Okay, good. I have had to switch to my phone, so I think we'll just have to be quick and um, we're not able to hear you, um, so maybe I can ask um, oh, Peter go. Pepper to. Uh, to Step everybody in. for the nice for the actors and the players who made this possible. Okay, if you can't hear me, can, can maybe you should because... We can hear you now. <laughs> okay. So I was saying that uh, I would like to express my appreciation to all the actors and players who made this possible for the second MIS to be conducted. And um, we're quite aware that malaria continues to be a major cause of morbidity and mortality, probably not so much of mortality as we've been able to improve the mortality end of things, but we still have a huge problem with malaria morbidity. Uh, it's good news that we can see a reduction in the prevalence, but as we face uh, new challenges, even in the face of this pandemic and possibly others that may come, 
it reminds us that we still have work to do and we need to redouble our efforts to try and at least, if not complete this one, put it to the background where it is no more a major problem for us. Um, the survey was detailed and well conducted and I'm grateful to all those who put this together. And um, there's no wonder we've come to rely on the Ghana Statistical Service to conduct these surveys uh, across the country to the highest possible standards. I've had my own experience with Peter and his crew in uh, working on the current malaria vaccine implementation program. Uh, the Malaria Control Program, Public Health Reference Lab, and also staff in my own institute have always been part of this, and uh, they've always tried to put in a good show. The, what I take from this is that once we have the support, we have the units and the personnel to be able to deliver what is needed for the country as we go forward. And we're grateful to the funders and the technical direction, technical support from ICF, USAID. Uh, the government of Ghana, and also all the others who's helped to this point. They've presented the highlights of the survey, and we're all happy to see the reduction in prevalence from 21 to 14% in children, increased bed net use among the children, not so much among the pregnant women, but uh, we're quite happy to see that we're making progress overall. There was, there was also a reduction in anemia prevalence, uh, the urban areas we are really seeing very low prevalence now and the only one that or the only thing that we need to take account of or one of the things we need to take account of is we need to explore more in western region to find out what is going on as there was no reduction at all in prevalence in the western region what I take from this and what I'll put down for us to look into as we plan for future things is that as the prevalence is coming down on a country level in all the regions and so, I think the time has come for us to look into the possibility of further drilling this down and maybe for the next survey, our units will have to go beyond the regions rather into the districts. And for a start, maybe we should look at exploring the data that we have now into the 16 regions that we have, uh, which have been created, although these were done after the survey data had been collected. So there will be some biases as we explore that, but it should give us some indicators as to what to do and how to go forward. Because my view is that uh, as the prevalence falls and as things improve, for us to achieve our objective of elimination, we need to further we need further granularization of the data to be able to find out what may be termed hotspots for the transmission and where things may be going down faster than we even uh, see in this large uh, was it aggregations. So um, I think I would join my voice to those who would express their appreciation and we appreciate our thanks to the Ghana government, the Ghana Statistical Service, the Ghana Health Service, the, my colleagues and friends at the Ghana, the Malaria Control Program, USAID, ISF, CDC, PMI, and all the others who've supported this effort, Global Fund, and also the participants who continue to give us their responses, even as we come to them from time to time. I was quite impressed with the response rate of 99.99%, which was quite uh, appreciated. So I'm looking forward to working with the data, exploring it further with students and also for our own work here at Noguchi and all the others. So thank you very much for this. And uh, I'll hand over to Sally. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like a, a drum roll, please. The 2019 Ghana MIS um, publications are now available online um, at dhsprogram.com. I have shared a link in the chat box <clears throat> to where you can access the final report, data set, fact sheet, wall, sheet, wall chart, and, and more. Links to the publications and, um, and data sets will also be shared with you. If you've already registered, uh, we'll send you um, a, a, 
a link to this as well. Um, additionally, the DHS program has digital tools uh, available for use. Um, I just demonstrated Stack Compiler, but we also have a free mobile app with uh, Ghana MIS data and uh, an application programming interface or API. Um, all the, all the publications and data are, are available for you now. And we will send a follow-up survey to everyone asking um, what you thought about the webinar. And I thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you. Thank so, um, maybe is, is it time to close us or what? Yes, we please. Close us? Okay, so. Thanks to everyone, to all the participants. I, at one point, I saw more than 150 people logged on, and uh, we're quite grateful that you could attend this. And we're also very happy for the uh, reports and all the things we can do with it, which we've just been shown. So thanks, everyone, and bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.